Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, your toaster won't take no for an answer. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson. And as always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Today, we're talking to Deborah Driggs. Her experience with divorce, trauma, and recovery has fueled her across the career landscape, from model to actor to sales to motivational speaker. She's with us today to share the story of divorces in her own life, first her parents and later her own, and to explore how she learned the power of taking risks, staying positive, and offering help to those who are in need. Deborah, welcome to the toaster. Hey, thank you so much for having me. What a it's a great topic. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have used you guys back in God 2003. I could have used your help. Where where do you I mean you've got this this uh you, the model you're under now, right? This not taking no for an answer is based on a on a, a talk you started giving in early 2020 and I'm I you know we we'll hear about kind of that at, at at the end. I'm curious how you get to that place where you realize, hey, I I have not only the experience and expertise here, uh, but I have the voice that needs to to share it and educate on it. I think I think a lot of my background got me to the place of, hey, no means maybe. Or the other thing I would always say is next very quickly. Because when you sit in rejection too long, it will resist you from moving forward and going on to the next sale. So no means maybe really probably came from all the rejection I got in acting and modeling. You know, you know, I went on thousands of auditions and maybe got, you get one, you get one. So the longer you stay in the game, you start to realize these things. And that's what I hope to, you know, share with other people is stay in the game, stay in line. Don't get out of line because then you got to start all over with something else. So we're, we're doing the whole thing in reverse, right? So now let's talk about um, your life changes that led you to to this point. Let's, uh, you know, divorce podcast. We got to talk about divorce and how it yeah, impacted absolutely. your your experience. Import, Can you, important subject. It's kind of an important subject for this show. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start when you think about how you integrate you, you integrated your divorce experience into your life? What, uh, tell us the story. Well, my divorce brought me to my knees. That is, that is a fact, literally brought me to my knees. I was with my mom and we were at a store called RC Willie. And this is in Salt Lake City for anybody that, that knows. And we're walking around the store and I literally fell to my knees and I was hysterically crying. And I don't usually do that hysterically crying. So I knew I was either having some sort of episode, or, you know, and my poor mother, who's kind of stoic herself, you know, she was just like didn't know what to do. And thank God we were kind of near, you know, the bed section. And I just <laughs> laid on one of those mattress. That's just, convenient. Yeah, it that was. Is convenient. It really was because I just laid there like I was pretending like I was trying out the mattress and I was crying. And I remember I called my my husband and I said, wait a minute, I just have to stop. I just if I had a bell, I would ring it. I have never heard that before. And I love it so hard. <laughs> My husband. Yeah, I don't like the word ex. Wow. Yeah, husband. Well, that's funny, Deborah, because I never use the term ex. I always say former spouse because I think spouse, ex has yeah. you know, something that that yeah, doesn't make totally. me feel bad about. Well, it, I love you know? it so much. Please continue. What, what's so, it for? What's for former spouse that was a wife? Is it has wife? Uh, no, do we have one? Do, like it has been? No, I don't, I don't have I don't one. Have oh, one. that's a good. I don't know. We'll have to come up with that. There okay, you go. I'm on okay. it. Okay, so I'm on but, it. <laughs> but you're in this store because I'm really captivated by this yes. scene that you've laid out. Were you thinking about your divorce at the time? Is that I was when regretting? It, I was regretting. I was in a complete regret moment. So, but were you already divorced? Yes, we were already divorced. This is this is the thing that Seth and I we've talked about this before. It's like the surprising place that grief hits you. For you, it's in RC Willie, and it drops you to your knees. To my knees, and and you know Tony Robbins says this all the time. Nothing will bring you to your knees quicker than a relationship that doesn't work out. And it's apps. When he said that, I was like, it happened to me. 
It literally happened to me. I was on my knees and I remember I called my, I was in that moment of, I fucked up. And, and I really did because, you know, I really married somebody that was a good, good one. He was a good one. And I, you know, I just was a mess. I really was. And that's really hard for me to admit because I was, I was a mess. I was only looking at his part. I never took the time to look at my part and what I, what I was bringing to the table. And that took me a lot of years to figure out. It took a lot of work, but yeah. So I called him, I called him and I said, I, we can't do this. We cannot do this. We have kids. I, I'm, I made a mistake. I'll do whatever it takes. And he said, it's too late. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and that's like part yeah. of the and, grief you know, process too. By the way, too, I though. could cry right now just thinking about that moment that I was on the phone because I'd realized I really, not only did I mess up horribly for my marriage, but I messed up horribly for my kids. Yeah. But what you just described where you guys were at two different points is you realized it, you were still in grief. You were in the bargaining phase where you're like, I'll do anything, which isn't actually what you were saying. That's how it feels at the time. There's certainly boundaries that you would set for yourself. And then he was already at acceptance. It's too late. That's that microcosm. It was too late. And, and, you know, and then it just got worse for me because I never got over that. I really didn't. And, and I spent probably the next few years that just that tape recorder just playing over and over. And then we get into there's other stuff, you know, he gets remarried really quick. Oh, uh, you know, that statistically happens. Guys typically get married much quicker remarried than women. Statistically. Yeah, so October 2004, we signed the divorce. July 2005, he goes to a courthouse and gets remarried. And I literally I called his dad. I said, no, stop. You know, I'm still grieving the divorce. And I can't, it's like, I couldn't, it just, it was all too much. And, you know, it's too bad for me. You know, it's like, that's not his problem. It was my problem. And it was all too much. I, I just really couldn't. Then I couldn't breathe. I was just like, I can't breathe. So how'd you get out of all that? Not a good story. So in 2008, I'm going to talk about this because, because I just wrote a chapter in a book. I was asked to be a, a, an author in a book. It's a collaboration with a lot of women authors. And so it's going to come out. So I'm just going to say it. In 2008, I couldn't bear it. So I took a bottle of pills and followed it with a bottle of vodka and ended up in a really bad situation. So it, it had gotten to that point. And it's, I woke up in a, a hospital. There was a police officer in my in my room and my friend who got me there. And I said, is he here for the person who's next to me? And he goes, are you out of your mind? He's here for you. And it, that's when it hit me that I had really gone down the rabbit hole. And I went, what? And he's like, Deborah, you tried to kill yourself. And I was like, okay. So I ended up in a lockdown situation where they literally put me in lockdown. And while I was in lockdown, I thought, I cannot believe my life got to this point. Did you feel like you're living someone else's life? Oh, God. It, 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 it was like I was in a really bad nightmare. Right. A really bad nightmare. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I just, there was no solution in sight really for me. I, I remember that I had this moment in lockdown where I thought, you really, I mean, you've got kids, you've got family. I mean, everybody was freaking out. And, and so I, I, they gave me a choice in lockdown. They said, and I'm in the state of Utah, and they don't look too kindly on suicide attempt. And so they gave me a choice. I could go to in front of a court or I could go to rehab. And so I chose rehab which was really a good thing for me because it saved I, your life. It saved my life, but it also really made me come to terms with the fact that I have an addiction. I I'm an alcoholic and, and that alcoholism, that ism, not so much the drinking, but the ism is what I really suffer for that emotional ism. And that's probably what got me to the point of, I want a divorce. Yeah. You know, because I had that ism and I didn't know, I didn't know that I had, that going on inside of me. And so that really affected my divorce. And 
So, you know, it took a lot of years and a lot of help to get to a place of healing. And even to this day, believe me, guys, this is not, you know, there's work to be done always. You know, I have found that you don't wake up one day and it's like, okay, I got this. And no, I really, I had to, I had to put myself in a, um, a rehab in 2020 and it, I call it a rehab, but it was really a week of trauma work. And in that week, I really, that's when I did the work on my divorce. In 2020, on a divorce that was signed in 2004. I did work on my divorce in 2020 because you get to do this extreme trauma work there. And I chose to do that because that was still on my mind. I felt like such a failure and I felt like I had really, oh, I could get so emotional talking about this, but I really did. I felt like a failure. I felt like I really let a lot of people down. And so I had to work through that and get to the other side. Do you think now that you're on the other side that, for example, that the people you're saying you let down, did they feel let down from the actual divorce or was it because of the other stuff going on? Well, the divorce affected everybody. It always does. It always does. And and then when you add in all the other things, you know, my emotional stability was off. My my alcoholism was progressing. And it really progressed after my divorce. Yeah. <laughs> how, how weird. How funny. <laughs> how ironic. Right? right. There's no right. accident that 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 divorce unlocked this trauma inside of me that I had been feeling since you mentioned it, since my parents' divorce, since since all the traumas from my childhood. All that divorce really did was open up a lot of wounds. And then it was like, which one do you deal with right. first? And flood it's like a rabbit, are, the it's a rabbit are hole effect. And right. I couldn't. I didn't have the tools to handle any of it. It was so it was it was so devastating and incomprehensible the stuff that was going on in my life and so yeah when i went and did that trauma work in 2020 it it, it was so good it wasn't for anybody else it was for me it just was for me and and they actually had me play out where somebody in my we were in a group of i think we had nine people in my group and you choose somebody to play your husband. And they he sat across from me while I did my work as if he was, you know, and I got to say everything that I never was able to say to my husband. The things that I wasn't able to say to him, I was able to say finally. And, you know, it doesn't make anything right. It doesn't for it doesn't I don't it doesn't change what happened. But what it does is I was able to forgive myself. And I was able to forgive all the other players because, you know, it takes two. Right. But Debbie, let's talk about, about, I mean, we really say this is a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. And the very first relationship is the one with yourself. Yes. And it it took you a long time to get there. <laughs> Guess but, what? <laughs> I didn't have a relationship with myself. So you right. wonder, you you wonder when two people get into these relationships and it's like, imagine this okay imagine i come to you and i've got my arms you can't see my arms but i've got my arms and there's pillows just stacked okay maybe there's one from my childhood you know maybe i was abused maybe there's one from some teacher maybe there's you know a, an accident a death whatever i come to the relationship with all these pillows and i say hey could you hold these pillows no 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 to the left no, 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 to the right. No, you're not doing it right here. Give them back. And then I go to the next person. You know what I mean? It's like we come to relationships with all these things that we've never worked on. And I have to tell you, the fact that I had 14 years of marriage with the ups and downs that we had and the deep love that we had. I mean, I, I'll just say for me, I was very much in love with my husband. You know, I there. I think when I look back, I think there's a reason why I haven't really gotten remarried because I knew that I had a lot of work to do on myself before I could really give anybody else that love. And so, yeah, that's how that's that's the kind of stuff that I think when you get into a relationship and you're not a whole person, 
You know what I mean? Like you haven't worked on all of those things. It's really hard to give another person a hundred percent of yourself because really the whole point is to go to a relationship to give, not to get. This is, uh, you know, this, the, the whole conceit here that is just landing on me is, you know, when you come for a divorce to your attorney, right, you're talking to Seth, there is a point at which the divorce process is ostensibly finished, but the divorce is not finished, right? I mean, here we're talking about it 15, 16, 17 years later, and still, it's still clearly raw. Absolutely. For me, it was years I was raw. I was so raw. There was no way, you know, and I had, you know, look, I, it's been a long time since I got divorced and I've had a lot of beautiful men come into my life. And it wasn't, I wasn't ready. It, it just, and it's interesting because when I look back and especially after I did that work in 2020, I realized, okay, when the student's ready, the teacher appears, it's kind of like, I get it. Because I'm, I, I really didn't want to go through what I went through in my divorce. I, 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 I'm really shy about going into something head on right now when I knew that I was not capable of handling another, another divorce. I mean, and I, you know, listen, I have friends that have been married five times and I think to myself, I just, I'm not that person. Right. But Deborah, I hear that all the time where people will say, at the end of their divorce process, I am never getting married again. And that, and the only reason they're saying it is because they're really saying, I'm never going through this divorce process again. That's what they're really afraid of. It's not that they're afraid of being married and being in a wonderful relationship that has the give and take. And like you say, you're in a relationship to give, not to, not to take. And you, you, and to live this amazing life and to share your life and walk the earth with somebody till the end of your days, it's they don't want to deal with guys like me. They don't want to deal with the legal system. They don't want to deal with the emotional aspects of dividing your stuff and letting people down. And I stood up in front of everyone and said, I do for life. And we have kids. That's what they don't want. Yeah. And that is a huge impediment to people moving on and saying, I am ready for a relationship. I'm ready to have a committed relationship. I'm ready to get married and it doesn't have to change who I am or our relationship with my soon to be spouse or committed partner or whatever boyfriend, whatever term you want to use to identify people. That is commonplace that people struggle with that. And I mean, I ran into someone the other day and they said, how are you doing? I said, oh, I got engaged. They're like, oh, my God, you're doing that again. <laughs> and I was like, Good I was luck. like, I was like, the engagement part was great <laughs> on the first time. That wasn't where the problems were. <laughs> right. And 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 they were still raw from the divorce where they just weren't there ready to say that they'll get married. And, and I hear that all the time years later. But you point out the fact that maybe if you're still saying, I don't want to get married, I won't get married, maybe you haven't really dealt with. Yeah. And so that's different today. Now I realize I'm in a place where now I'm more open to it. But the thing that I really, you know, because now that I've done all this healing and, and you know, I, this is what I speak about a lot is healing in general, not just for divorce, but just in general, is to how to prevent going down the road of divorce. You know, I wish. The things that I know now, I would have known and I would have gotten help, you know, in 2003. I would have gotten help for the things that I was suffering with. And so when I talk with people or people, you know, come to me for a coaching session or whatever, I always say, before you get the divorce, before you go down that road, you know, make sure you exhaust all the possibilities out there because you don't want to be, listen, take it from me. You don't want to be in a position where you're going to regret you know, doing something that is, it's a really big decision. <laughs> you know, it really is. I'll speak to that for a minute, Deborah, because I get what we call potential clients. And I'll get a call from 
My wife just filed. I got served with papers too. I think my spouse is going to file for divorce too. I want my marriage to work. I don't know if it's going to, what do I need to get prepared for? I'm not ready to do this now. And I always tell them like, you called me. I'm not, you know, it's not, I'm not like doing robo calls. Hey, you thinking about a divorce? And, and we, we meet people where they are, right? It's a different conversation I have when someone says, oh my God, I have 20 days to answer. I'm freaking out. I've just been sued in divorce court, right? Compared to someone that says, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do I have to do? And on the latter one, I'm thinking about this. I'll talk more about, have you done all the hard work? Have you gone to counseling? Have you done the work for yourself? I can tell you the basics about a parenting plan and dividing assets and how alimony works in Florida and child support. We'll go through all that and the horrible legal process you have to go through. But is that what you're really asking me? Or are you asking me, what can I do to still avoid a divorce. And that's where I think the attorney and counselor at law comes in. I'm not a marriage counselor. I will refer people out, but you've got to meet your clients where they are and see if you can help them, even if it's for an initial half hour consultation. Yeah, I I, I think it's I think it would be really a great thing now and to especially in today's world to say, before you come to me, I have somebody you should go talk to that might change your mind. You know, I mean, if I had done just a little bit of work on myself before I made this decision, I mean, I don't know. I don't like to play the what if game. That's not my style, but I I do think about it. You know, I think about where I am today. I'm so, I am not that person anymore. And I, I live a much different life. And that is something to really look at, you know? So when I, I, like I said, when I have people come and ask me, you know, what should I do? What should I do? I'm not here to give anybody answers on anything. I can guide, I can guide you. I can share my experience and say, you know, try to do some type of 30 day program because, you know, there's always something inside each individual that's debilitating them in the marriage. People don't divorce for a lack of love. Usually it's usually something else. You know, I didn't leave my husband because I didn't love him. You know, I still love him. I can say that. I still have, you know, very fond, very loving thoughts for him. So, you know, there there, there should be something of like, let's take 30 days. Let's do these things. And a- after 30 days, if you feel the same way, okay, we can go down this road. But if you just do this work for 30 days, it might put on a different pair of lenses. It might remind you. It might remind you of where you were when you got married. Well, and and I want to talk a little bit about that and change change directions just briefly because um, I, I feel like there might there are some lessons learned here. We've already sort of teased this concept that you know when divorce happens, it impacts everybody, and and it feels like from others we've talked to, had on the show, we talk about the divorce stories that all eyes are on you while you're getting a divorce. And in your case, both you and your husband actually did have eyes on you through your divorce, right? You both had a degree of celebrity at the time of your marriage and divorce. And uh, and I I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the experience of essentially getting married or getting divorced, like living your marriage in public like that. We were very fortunate that we were very we were very private. We were raising our kids in Park City, Utah, in a very small town, and nobody really paid attention to that. I will say this. People were really shocked when we got divorced. I would get calls, wait, you guys, you're, you guys are like, you, you're so in love. What? Like people were pretty baffled, you know, that we were getting divorced. I, I mean, can totally relate to that. Yeah. Even just meeting you right now and doing research for this conversation, my thought as an outsider, looking at pictures of you on the internet at the time, I'm like, They are so hot. Of course, they're a perfect couple, right? It is so easy to get wrapped up in that story that I've told myself and disregard everything you're actually living through. Yeah. And so I, we had, I, I had people say, really, you guys, because we really, we, we were really fun together. And 
you know, like I, I don't think I ever called him Mitch. I, you know, I always called him lover. Mm -hmm. Hey lover, where are you? Lo you know, if I, if he, uh, Hey lover, what's going on? You know, we, it was always, you know, there was always these really playful, beautiful. And we were, we had, it wasn't like, you know, some married couples just have no chemistry whatsoever. We had tons of chemistry and, you know, even with three kids, you know, we had three children back to back. And so, yeah, it, I think for the people in our lives, it was like, wait, what? No. But that happens, I think, all yeah. the time. I mean, first off, it's different when anyone who has any bit of celebrity, however you're going to define that term, gets divorced, especially in the modern age with all the social media, right? And it's just everywhere. Well, we didn't have it back then. Right, right, which is fortunate. Which right. is really fortunate, <laughs> right. trust me, because but when God, you I, when ugh. you when people come to me and one of them saying, "Oh, I'm going to take you to court. Everything is going to get all the dirty laundry is coming out," and they talk to me about that, I'm like, nobody cares. If you actually knew how often people thought about you in your marriage, it's so small in their life. Of course. Like how little they actually of think course. about you. And it's like, it's going to be like, oh my God, that's really, really terrible that they're going through that. Or, oh my God, this person totally blew up their life. Look at all this crazy stuff they did. And then the next thing you're going to hear from is, oh, let's go grab a drink. <laughs> like, like, let's, let's go hang out. Let's go in. Like, we're back to our own lives. Although, right. Although I find it really fascinating that everyone is glued to this Amber Heard and Johnny Depp debacle. It's like, right? yeah. Just don't, it's like the most crazy thing that thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are tuned in for this yeah. nonsense. Sure really. But I think, I think that concept of what happens is, and this is just the psychology stuff that I've read is that that is people just saying, look at these people who are airing all this stuff out in public. And in today's world, it's magnified, like we said, because of social media, right? And everybody has an opinion and everybody has something to say. But how long are they really engaged in that? And what, if anything, is anyone saying meaningful, right? It's easy to do a post or make a comment. Yes. But look, at the end of the day, those same people have to go live their lives, pay their mortgage, get their kids to school, do their job. like. So, but what we see is the cumulative effect of all those people. So it looks like it's happening all the time, but even for those people that are really invested in how much during a day and kind of what's going on in their own lives. But the people in my world, let me tell you, you go into a divorce court and you're in a two day trial or a full day trial, there's going to be the following people in the courtroom, both lawyers. Both parties, yeah. the judge, yes. the bailiff, the court reporter, we're up to seven. And if you happen to have another witness that's on the stand, the witness, eight. Maybe a lawyer or two has somebody else, a paralegal there. There's nobody sitting in the back of the courtroom like you see in the movies. Nobody cares. And if they do care, they're not coming down on Wednesday at two o'clock because they've got to be at work. Yep. It's true. According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, approximately 10% of children live with a parent with an alcohol use disorder. This is an alarming statistic as a family law professional who deals with custody cases regularly. Finding the balance between the child's safety and helping the child maintain a relationship with both parents is one of the hardest things to navigate. Add in the he said, she said phenomenon that happens with divorcing couples who often weaponize alcohol use against one another, and the situation is even more difficult. All of this is why Soberlink has been one of the most important tools for my clients dealing with these issues. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring tool has helped over 500,000 people prove their sobriety and provide peace of mind regarding the child's safety. Soberlink helps keep the focus on the best interest of the child, which is really the most important part in a divorce case dealing with children. I've teamed up with Soberlink to create a parenting plan guide to help people going through divorce that involves alcohol in children. 
And you can download it today at soberlink.com slash toaster. And if you take a look and you think you're ready to order Soberlink, just mention how to split a toaster for $50 off their device price. Our thanks to Soberlink for sponsoring How to Split a Toaster. Okay, so the divorce, challenging. The next four years, significantly challenging. At some point, you, you're able to turn a corner and find some sort of light, some sort of positive attitude. Do you remember when you when you turn that corner and realize, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm me. I can I can do something new. I think I covered up for a lot of years with with the success of business. Yeah. You know, I got it totally business changed gears. And, yeah. Yeah. I got I changed gears completely and, and got very independent in business and through that success brought up other stuff because now all of a sudden I had this freedom and I had never thought of myself as a business person. And so now I had all this stuff going on with that. And, and even that wasn't making me happy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so this is such a great, these are such great lessons in life. It's, it's kind of a bummer that we can't learn this right out of the gate. You know, yeah. and it wasn't in the this, manual. Where's the damn not. manual? <laughs> it was not because just you know, Google how to split a toaster, Pete. There's the manual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I had all this great success. I, I met a lot of my goals. I've done a lot of great things that should bring happiness. And it just wasn't, you know, so I kept going. If I just had this relationship, everything would be great. Well, I had that relationship. If I just made this much money, everything would be great. Well, I did that. If I just got into the best shape of my life, I would be happy. I did that. So the 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 moral of the story is, is that nothing is going to bring this happiness, nothing external, nothing. Right. Because I've tried it. I've tried it all and I've succeeded. Some people don't even get to succeed in all those different things. Yeah. They don't even get to the point where they realize this thing isn't going to give me happiness. No. The money, the everything. So else. today, my life is completely different. Like I said, I live a very different life. It's not about all those addictions because it wasn't just alcoholism. I have ism, <laughs> which is. Okay, if I'm going to buy a pair of shoes, I buy 10. You know, it's like nothing. One is not enough. That's not an <laughs> ism. And they're all black. And every woman I've ever met can get another Guess pair of black shoes. Is. Shopping is an ism. <laughs> Shopping, gambling, sex, love, <sighs> alcohol, drugs, anything, food. It's all part of this thing. So when you give one up, Another one creeps in. And so for me, it was shopping. And then that I had to stop that. And then another one creeps in. It becomes like chocolate and chips. You know, it's like it doesn't matter what it is. And so I I have the song in a few of my favorite things going through my head right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And trust me, but see, I have that that thing where I don't have like, oh, I can try that. And that's great. I want to divulge. So my life is different today. I, I the external stuff doesn't work at least not for this human being. And so for me, it's a very simple life. I have a routine. I spend a lot of time writing. I spend a lot of time doing podcasts and and coaching other people. And I have a, a, if somebody would have told me five years ago, okay, so here's the deal. You're going to be a coach. You're going to write a weekly blog and you're going to write a memoir about addiction. I would be like, it's never going to happen. Wow. Here we are. (laughs) Yeah, right. You know, five years later and all of those things, my whole life is about being of service. It's like, who can I help today? Okay, I'm going to write this blog and hopefully it'll reach somebody that's suffering with this. Because I know from experience that I spent a majority of my life quietly suffering. I never asked for help. I never told anybody. I never told anybody I felt suicidal. I never, you know, and by the way, I don't want to die, but I have those feelings. That's the, the trick of grief. That's scary to walk around feeling that you want to harm yourself or that you don't feel you're worth being on this planet and you don't tell anybody about that. And I did that for years. I would be, I would be, by the way, at the height of my career, you know, whatever, on the cover of a magazine and 
showing up to do some press thing and and on the inside on the outside everybody's like you know I'm doing all the stuff. Pictures and flashbulbs and yeah, all the good and stuff. and on the inside. Right, I'm but Deborah, like, oh. hold on on that. Let me, let me back up because you said yeah. something really important is that what I think I heard you say is I didn't ask for help. So you help people now. I'm in the helping business, though people don't view divorce lawyers necessarily <laughs> like that. But um, I, so I, hold on. I have to you laugh know. a minute. You cost a lot more money, you cost a lot more money than me. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Hey, people, come talk to me first. I'm a lot cheaper, and I might really okay, actually we help Okay, we got to talk to Andy, our uh, producer, to make sure some of this yeah. gets cut out. Okay. <laughs> no, so, no. But you don't just call people. I don't just call people saying, hey, you looking for help. So one is, how do you get to the point where you say, I need help. In the divorce world, it's a lot easier. Someone serves you with divorce papers, you know you need help, right? Well, I waited. So going back to my earlier story, I waited to, I let it go too long to the point where I was suffocating and tried to kill myself, you know, literally with a bottle right. of pills. So, so that you know, was you know, rock listen, bottom. Me, that was rock bottom. That was re- immoralizing demoralization. And at, that's at what made finest. you realize I need help. So now well, no. <laughs> okay yeah, let's let's uh, let me be let me be brutally honest about this that forced me into getting help there's a difference right i didn't know how to get help but that forced me into it when i really asked for help i think was in about 2016 17 somewhere around then is when my healing journey started i thought okay i've done everything that would bring anybody else out there a lot of happiness and I'm suffering. I'm still suffering. This is a slow death, people. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, so why would you want to be living and breathing every day if you're, if you're not, if you're suffering quietly on the inside? Well, that's the question I ask people when they call me and they say, well, should I get a divorce? I say, well, that's a personal decision, but I have a question for you. Do you want to feel the same way you feel now two years from now? And it, they always say no. And if the answer to that is no, then you've got to make some changes. You either have to make some changes in yourself and work on those with your partner to be in this marriage, or you need to make some changes with yourself and get out of the marriage. But you can't keep doing what you're doing. That is such a great question. Do you, you is the key word. Do you want to feel this way two years from now? And that's the key word because. If you don't do the 30 to 90 day work on yourself, you may never know. If I had done the 90 day work that I do now, that I do personally, that I created, if I did this work back then, my answer would have been completely different. Wouldn't have been about him. It would have been about me. I would have looked at my part, what I was bringing to the table, what I was doing wrong, what I needed to improve on, not him. I loved him. Unfortunately, he got the brunt of it. (laughs) Unfortunately, he did not know. Honestly, he did not know that I was suffering so horribly. He had had glimpses of it, but he didn't really, he didn't know the, the depth of what was really going on with me. And that can be very confusing in a marriage. When you're in a marriage and you don't really know what's going on with the other partner because you're so consumed with yourself. And how everything's affecting you. So I think that the most beautiful thing that two people can do is work on themselves first before they start looking at, because really what we're doing is we're looking at all the things we don't like in ourselves when we should be looking at all the beautiful things we love in this person. This is uh, this has been lovely, Deborah. Thank you, uh, first of all, for joining us and uh, for sharing your insights and experience. Uh, I I feel like there's there's so much to to plumb. We could do this all day, um, but all day. Uh, but you know, when you're talking about you know doing the work yourself and now helping people, where let's let's go ahead and talk about where you want to send people to learn more about the work that you do and where they can uh, where they can reach out for your wisdom. Absolutely, absolutely. Before you go down the road of getting a divorce, 
Come to me, please come to me. I'll even, I'll give you a free consultation. If you're listening to the show and you feel like you want to get a divorce or you feel like you're in a relationship and you want to end the relationship, I'll give you a free consultation. Just mention that you heard me on this show and we'll do a free consultation. Deborah, are those confidential? Absolutely. And the reason I ask is I'm worried Pete, I, I'm worried Pete's going to call you about ending a relationship <laughs> with me. I just, <laughs> you yeah. should always be and on your you toes, like Nelson. Your always be on your toes. <laughs> We're watching. But yeah, so uh, come to my website, which is deborahdriggs.com. So it's my name.com. Here are the things that happen when you come to my website. I make it really simple. You can find me on all my social media. I don't have to list it all off right here. Just come to my website. Sign up for my free newsletter. It's free. And by the way, coming soon, I have a free gift coming to all my subscribers. Is it a pizza? Uh, no. No. It's no. not a pizza. It's something that will last forever. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, it's a free gift to my subscribers. If you come to my website, you can link on to all my social media so you know exactly where I am. All my blogs that I've written, I just wrote this week was my 52nd blog. So I, I wrote saw that you did your 52 week challenge. Congratulations. I did my 52 week challenge. By the way, I just, when I first set out, my team said, you know, why don't you write a, a blog for the website? And so we, you know, we're thinking maybe once a month, maybe, you know, once every couple months. And me, me, me <laughs> said, well, if I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it, let's do one a week. And so, so I, I did it. So this week was 52 weeks of blogs. Good for you. And then, you know, here's how the universe works going back to no means maybe. And, you know, just how I believe that everything's a spiritual game is by doing that blog, you know, people start to read it because I put it on my Facebook page. And so by, I got a call to be a guest author in a book. And that's the book that's coming out July 7th. That's, this is why you want to come to my website. What's because the, all what's of the these, book called? Do you know? Okay, it's called Here us? Comes, of course I know. It's called Here Comes the Sun. All women authors, women that went through something dark and had to pull themselves out. So there's a lot of great, a lot of great chapters and a lot of great stories. And it's just filled with a lot of hope for anybody that's going through a dark time. So you really want to come to my website because there's going to be a launch on July 7th and you'll, you can get the book. You can download it for $1.99. Okay. How awesome is that? And that's only going to be for a 24, 48 hour period. So there's many reasons to come to my website. Many. I also have another book coming out and I'll just mention this real quick. It's called Son of a Basque. My grandfather wrote this book. What I found inspiring at, about the book when I read it was I didn't know half of the things that I read about my grandfather. And there was a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma. And that's intriguing to me because I really believe that that's in my nervous system. As a parent, whatever's in my nervous system is kind of my kids are getting that. They didn't ask for it, but they're getting it. And that's kind of what I felt is that all this trauma that my grandfather went through, my mother got, I got. And so when I looked at that, I was like, here's an opportunity to kind of look at these family systems and these traumas. And, you know, we have to break these cycles. And so I read it three times. I couldn't believe how good it was. So I kind of did some editing and rewriting in it. And then it's going to be published in November. And so that's really exciting. That's like been the, the biggest project that I've been working on. So again, these are reasons why if you come to my website, you get my newsletter, all these things, you'll have an opportunity. You'll know in advance when there's, there's really fun stuff coming out. And the next year, my memoir will be coming out. You're busy. Well, we will put links into all of this stuff in the show notes. Yep. Uh, Deborah, again, thank you so much for, for uh, sharing a bit of your life with us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Andy, Pete, Seth. It was so wonderful to be here. And wow. Even Andy's getting a call Stop. out there. We, just, we, we need to. We'll cut that. Don't worry. We don't want to give him too much. We don't want to give him too much. <laughs> well, he does the real work. <laughs> right. That's See, right. Andy does the real work. Yeah. We just show yeah. up and gab, and he's in the background doing all the work. So I can, yes, I, of I course. can already see him writing the email that he wants a raise. So please, just 
Top, top. <laughs> we really appreciate you, uh, Deborah. Thank you so much thank for being you. here uh, on behalf of. Uh, and don't forget, everybody, um, you know, please uh, jump over to the the show notes. You'll find a link to ask us a question. If you have any questions, divorce questions, please send them our way. Seth would would love to start digging into uh, your divorce process. Let's do it. Yes, and if I can't help you, I promise I'll send you to Seth. <laughs> there you go. There I had go. that joke That's teed all we, up. All we wanted. I had that joke teed up. I didn't say it. I've been holding it back. <laughs> Deborah, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the fantastic Deborah Driggs and America's favorite divorce attorney, Seth Nelson, I'm Pete Wright. We will catch you back here next week on How to Split a Toaster a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.